Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. So our third step decision, okay, to turn your will and life over to God. I think in the beginning it's, it's not unreasonable to look at this as I'll, I'll make a decision to be helpful if you don't believe in God. Okay. Sometimes the step looks too big on the wall. In the book, there's a process to it. And, and if you can make it as easy as possible, I'd suggest... I saw it through the experience. I saw that that's what was happening. I didn't think of myself as turning my will and life over to God. But when I looked back on it, I could see that literally that's what was happening as I was doing some of the things that I was doing. You know, what Rick is talking about here is that there is no excuse to not do this. Yeah. That can be an excuse. Well, I don't believe in God. That can be an excuse to not want to do this step. There is no excuse to not do this. This it, Alcoholics Anonymous is a program of action. This is take some action. Do some stuff. See what happens. That's all we're talking about. We want to make this reasonable. Why? Because it is reasonable. It isn't that hard. Once you start to look at this, you'll start to see it. Look at the prayer. But here they say... The third step decision could have little permanent effect unless you take inventory or clean house, as they say it. Okay? In other words, you'll see a lot of people come into AA and they do the waltz. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. You know, they won't go past the third step. See, they come right up against the fourth step. They go, oh, I'm going to judge myself. They read it off the wall and it says, right, that I'm going to judge myself. I'm going to write a sin list. Treatment centers have done this. They've made it look like what we're going to do is we're going to write all the, we're going to take an immoral inventory, right? Instead of a moral inventory, we'll take an immoral inventory and write all the terrible things. That's because they read the step off the wall instead of out of the book. Now, in the book, there's a process to it just like there is to the third step. And it looks very different in the book than it does on the wall. I know you guys have heard that. Right, write down all the bad things you did. You've heard that for inventory. That's not what we're going to do. It's nothing like what we're going to do. That's good news, huh? We're not going to do that. Okay. We're not going to write down all the bad things we did. Okay. Okay, so we're going to make a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of, we're going to let this stuff go, the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. From what? An experience of God, a power greater than ourselves. Okay? We're going to let go of the things that are blocking us. We're going to subtract, not add. Okay? Here's the point. If you'll let go of what you're not, what will emerge is what you are. You understand that? You don't have to do something to be spiritual. You're already spiritual. If you'll let go of what's not spiritual, your spirituality will emerge. That's why in the spiritual experience, they talk about everybody else sees it before the newcomer does. Everybody sees his spirituality emerging. He doesn't think he's spiritual. This is the same thing that happened to me. A guy came up to me when I was about, I don't know, maybe eight months sober, six months sober, something like that. I was excited. I'd been doing inventory. I was happy. I was resolving the conflicts. I felt great. And a guy comes up to me, and I'm still an atheist. you got to understand. It hasn't changed quite yet, but it's shaking. It's starting to shake loose. The <laughs> guy comes up to me, and he says, Will you help me spiritually? I looked at him. I almost laughed right in his face. I thought, What the heck are you talking about? I couldn't believe he said it to me. It shocked me at the time. See, he saw something in me. He's enthusiasm. Now, the word enthusiasm, the root of it in Greek, from what I was told by a guy, said it means filled with the gods. Enthusiasm. Now, the problem is you can have lots of enthusiasm and no awareness. And you'll see people around the program like that. They've got great enthusiasm for the program, but they don't have any awareness of how their actions are affecting other people. See, So it's important to get some awareness of how this looks or how we're acting toward others. 
So we had to get down to causes and conditions. Yeah, there, liquor is a symptom. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and a fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. Okay, so you understand this now? Inventory is not about judgment. When you come in, if you're in a business, if you've ever done inventory in a business, what do you do? You count things. If you come in this room to inventory it, you're going to count chairs and tables. You don't judge the chairs and tables. If it's a broken chair, you don't say it's a bad chair, do you? No, it's a broken chair. Well, in the next sentence, it's going to say what to do with that, okay? One object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he could not fool himself about values. Okay, so get rid of it promptly and without regret if it doesn't work. If it's an idea that isn't helpful, get rid of it promptly if it doesn't work. So what if it's logical? Well, it should work. Well, it isn't working. Well, it should. It makes sense. Well, it don't. Get rid of it. Okay? This is the problem with this thing up here. It, it's crazy. So what if we take... Now, he used the example. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and a fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. So Joe and Charlie made this, made this point off their tapes. They said, we're going to make a searching and fearless moral inventory. A searching, fact-finding, fearless, fact-facing, moral, truthful. How about if we take a fact-finding, fact-facing, truthful inventory? Get out of the judgment business for the sake of the inventory, okay? Let's do it like Joe Friday. Remember the detective on Dragnet, on the TV show Dragnet? He used to go out to the, go out to the, the crime scene, and the woman or whatever the situation was would be flopping around, angry, freaking out because of what happened. And he'd stop and he'd say, just the facts, ma'am. Don't give me all your emotions. Just give us the facts so we get, you see, we, as soon as you become emotional, that's when you start distorting the facts. Okay? When you're angry, you're emotional. Then you exaggerate points, minimize others, leave relevant information out of the story. See, so we're going to look for facts, fact-finding, fact-facing, truthful inventory. Is that okay? Just for the sake of inventory, set the word moral. I look the word moral up. It's ethical. It means good, bad, right, wrong. Our religion is ethical. We think ethically. It's just the way we are in our culture, okay? The problem with, with looking at things ethically is you just won't look. And people come right up against the fourth step and they think they're going to hate themselves or judge themselves. Set that aside so you can at least look honestly. Fact-finding, fact-facing, truthful inventory. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. Don't say we took stock judgmentally. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. I was interested. I was an atheist, and I wanted to find out why I was failing at life. Being convinced that self manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. Resentment is the number one offender. Okay, look at what this says now. This is often misquoted around AA rooms, okay? And I'm telling you, I did it myself, so I understand. And you'll hear it all the time. People will say, resentment's the problem then, right? No, it's not what we read. We read, here's what, now, being convinced, first hundred people wrote this, being convinced that self, selfishness, my need to take from life, self, manifested in various ways, came about in my life experiences, manifested, was what defeated us. That's what defeated us, self or selfishness. We're going to consider the common manifestations of self or selfishness. The next sentence is resentment is the number one offender. It's the number one common manifestation of self or selfishness. Resentment is the outcome of being selfish. Selfishness is the problem. Resentment's the manifestation of it. Now you've heard that misinterpreted a lot around AA, haven't you, that resentment is the problem? Resentment is not the problem. It's the outcome of selfishness, which is the problem. This is an important distinction because I'll tell you what happened to me. 
I, I, I did inventory, didn't understand it, got tremendous relief, and I stayed selfish, okay? And then as life went on in sobriety, I started becoming angry again. Why? Because I wasn't getting what I wanted. And I get angry when I don't get what I want. And then the resentment starts to eat at you again. And if you don't do something with it, you may drink again. And this happens all the time to people. Selfishness is the problem. So resentment is the number one offender, the number one outcome. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else? Resentment does. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease, for we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. So I'm not only mentally and physically ill, I'm spiritually sick. This next sentence changed my life. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out physically. The word malady means illness. I had to look it up. I didn't know. I, I've had to look a lot of this stuff up because I just didn't know. And it's easy to skip past this stuff and not know, see? So when the spiritual illness is overcome, what's the spiritual illness? Holding resentment. Why? Because when you hold a resentment, if I look, for example, and I hold a grievance toward her for something, I'm literally separating myself from her. I don't want to be around her. I'm going to get away from her. You can feel the split happen as soon as you start building the case. You don't want to be around somebody you're angry at. See? So you get away. You split off from them. See? You split yourself off from God at the same time. We're all God's kids. We're all connected at that level. If I separate myself from a person, I'm separating myself from God. And I'm telling you, you will feel the pain of the separateness. Start building a case and see how you feel. See if you don't feel alone, isolated, afraid. And see if you don't have a need to tell the story of why you're angry to someone else. And then observe yourself when you tell the story. And just watch your mind distort the facts. Exaggerate, minimize, leave information out. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I see it in myself. I see it today when I do it. The difference is I see it. I used to not see it at all and I believed my own stories. And the more you rehearse the story, the more clever you get with it. See, the more you tell it, the more guilty they get and the more innocent you get. But the problem with this is you don't get rid of guilt by giving it away. You keep it. And the more you try and make someone else guilty, the more guilty you'll feel. And it's just an experience. You don't even have to believe that. Just start doing it and see how you feel. You can test this out. Don't have to believe a word of this. Try it. See. We had a guy at a workshop the other day. This is a great story. And this is how we know their stories. Was, you know, the stories always get better as time goes by, right? They don't stay the same. They get better. This guy worked for a company. He had an opportunity to get promoted. But in order to take the promotion, he would get a company car. And he didn't want a company car because he'd have to pee in a cup. And he wasn't ready to do that because he'd get busted. Because he wasn't stopping drinking. Right. Thing. So he tells the employer the story that his wife says, he can't be away from home and travel that much, so he can't take the promotion. Thank you very much, but I can't take it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then he goes home and tells his wife that the boss didn't give him the promotion. Now he's got it going on, but he, he he's telling the story both ways. Yeah, he told us he told us this at the meeting. It didn't take very long, but he's really angry at both the employer and his wife. <laughs> <laughs> and the story is a contradiction. Isn't that amazing? He believed his own stories. And he's got a resentment against both of them. <laughs> Unbelievable. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. So this is what we're going to do. Here, one, one point I want to make before we move on. When the spiritual malady is overcome, when you let the resentment go, you'll straighten out mentally and physically. You see this? You can't straighten out mentally and physically first because the mental and physical ailments are emanating from holding resentments. And it makes you sick. So the story is how you get sick. The story will be how we'll get well. Do you see how AA uses this? It's astonishing what they did here. Of course, they stole this from the Oxford group, so they weren't quite as bright as we'd like to think they were. But, but the, this, is, this is great because it, the spiritual malady is not about being bad. It's about holding on to conflict and grievance. Yeah. That's what the spiritual malady is. 
when I'm angry and upset and, and uh, I don't want to be around you, I am way sick. I just, I feel awful. I feel miserable. That's what happened to me when I was uh, uh, dry for such a long time. I hated everybody. Unconditional I, hate. Unconditional hate. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hated everybody except my son, and I wasn't too sure about him sometimes. <laughs> yep. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. Okay, we're going to write them down. Okay. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. That's column one on page 65. People, institutions, or principles. That's the first column I'm resentful at. Now, people is obvious. Institutions, I'm telling you, I had lots of resentments, believe it or not, against institutions. Example, Northern States Power, the Water Department, the gas company. And I'm telling you, I had resentment. I built cases against these so I could steal gas. I bypassed my gas meters. I did all kinds of stuff over grievances that I had. I just wanted to steal gas, that's all. But I had to build the case to justify it, see, you know? Oh, yeah, oh, I did this. Oh, it was awful. It was just awful. So I had resentments against Hennepin County, Ramsey County, the meter maids, the police force, Northern States, Power, my mother, dad, brother, sister. Oh, jeez, it's just <laughs> terrible. It just, so institutions was a big one for me, believe it or not, it really was. So then principles is another story. Now, what would a principle look like? Well, let's say uh, you're angry at the Catholic Church because you want to have sex before marriage. Okay? You're angry at the principle of that. That's why I'm angry. You might be angry at the IRS or the government for taking your tax money. I know a guy who was livid with the IRS. He said it was unconstitutional that they shouldn't have been able to, and he may or may not have been right. I don't know. There's some people arguing and fighting this in courts right now. I don't care if you're right or wrong. The outcome was he was angry, see? So he was angry at the principle of paying taxes. You understand? So that's what a principle that you could be angry at might look like. So we're going to write down people, principles, or institutions with whom we are angry. People will probably do, uh, you know, at first. We asked ourselves why we were angry. That's column two, the cause. Why am I angry? In most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. We were burned up. That's why I'm angry. Because somebody is threatening, I'm going to lose something. I'm afraid I'm going to lose something. See, fear is the motivator here. I'm afraid, and that's why I get angry. Most men certainly don't see their fears as much as women do. It just seems to be the way it is. We're conditioned differently in society. Well, we may see them, we just don't want to talk about them. Or we don't want to admit them or something. I don't know. But whatever the, whatever the reason is, it doesn't even matter. But the point is, is that anger is fear. Fear is the primary emotion. Anger is the outcome. Okay. They're directly related. There's a relationship. Now, you can be fearful without being angry, but I've never found any anger that wasn't rooted in fear for me. So, on our grudge list, we set opposite each name our injuries. This is the third column, how I was injured in this situation that I'm angry about. Was it our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal or sex relations which had been interfered with? Okay. Self-esteem. What does it mean? Self-esteem means how I see myself, how I want others to see me. I want to hold a certain image in people's minds and somebody gossips about you, makes you look bad. I get angry at them because of it. That might be how I was injured. Was it my security? Now, they look at security primarily as financial in here. It doesn't, I suppose it could be emotional, but when they talk about it and list it in the columns, they show it as money, okay? So security looks like money in here. Our ambitions. Now, ambitions was a big one for me. Ambitions are goals that you have for life. 
Okay? Let's say, I'll give you an example. Pam and I were together for 11 years. When I got sober, I was about two months sober, and we were struggling and trying to stay together or trying to get apart, and we were getting counseling. Finally, we split up. And it wasn't my idea. I didn't want to lose my family, see? I, I really tried very hard to hang on to that relationship, you know, and, I, and I'd like to tell you, just a side note, that I'm really a good guy and I'd like, I wanted to keep my family because I love Pam and I love my children. That's true, I did. But there was another element of this. I hated my dad for breaking up my family when I was a child with his alcoholism, and the last thing I wanted to do was what my dad did to his family. Unfortunately, I'd already done it you see. So I would have done anything to hang on to her because I knew that judgment would come on me. I had a sense of this even back then, so I had some awareness of this stuff. So I manipulated and tried to control to get her to stay, and I couldn't do it. She left. So my ambition to have a family was interfered. You understand? She took the kids and left. I lost my goal, my ambition. That's why I was angry. So ambitions can, maybe it's a promotion at a job. Maybe you lost a job because somebody gossiped about you or told the truth in gossip, okay? And they shouldn't have told it, you know? Maybe you were stealing or doing something and you lost the job or whatever. That would be an ambition. I had an ambition to have a, to get a certain career or something. People can interfere in our ambitions. And that was a big one for me. And then it says personal or sex relations. Well, that's, did somebody interfere in a personal relationship? Maybe, maybe I told Bob something in confidence that I, about one of our other friends, and he leaks it to him, and now I got a conflict with this guy, and I didn't want him to tell him. So Bob interfered in my personal relationship, or maybe it happened with a sexual relationship. You see how that looks now? It's pretty simple. You know what this is? These three columns are simply the story of why I'm angry. That's all this is. It's your story. May be true, may not be true. Let's look at them. Let's see if it's accurate. Because when you get angry and emotional, that's when I'm particularly stupid. And I make mistakes when I'm emotional about things, see. I'm not, I, I let my emotions run me and that's when I make errors in my thinking. Probably some truth in these stories, probably some accuracy in these stories. Sure. But- the fact that the stories have a way of changing and evolving over time, you know, there's uh, uh, these are stories. When, when we write this stuff, we start out writing this stuff, this is, I'm writing down exactly what happened. Well, guess what? I'm writing down a story that I tell myself of and what others. it looks like. And Well, and others, of course. Yeah. It's a story. That's all it is. So, we were, go ahead. We were usually as definite as this example. So here, we're going to read them across the columns. This is the story of why he's angry at Mr. Brown. I'm resentful at Mr. Brown. Why? His attention to my wife. That affects my sex relations, my self-esteem, and I'm fearful. He's afraid of losing his wife, and that's why he's angry at Mr. Brown, because he's paying attention to his wife. Right? See how simple that is? That's the story. I'm resentful at Mr. Brown. He told my wife of my mistress. That's irritating. (laughs) <laughs> what a rat. <laughs> that definitely affects my sex relations. <laughs> Look like a fool, self-esteem. And Fear. I'm afraid. He's afraid. Afraid of losing his mistress and his wife. And who knows what else. I'm resentful at Mr. Brown. Brown may get my job at the office. you got to kill Mr. Brown. That's all there is to if it. If this it's is just... true, you got to kill him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is actual experiences, you know. They wrote actual circumstances from their lives. How does that affect him? It affects his security if he loses his job at the office. It affects his self-esteem. He looks foolish, looks like a failure. Self-esteem, how I see myself, how I want others to see me. Okay, that's why he's angry at Mr. Brown. So there's there's one example. This, This guy, I feel like the biggest idiot in the world. This Mr. Brown guy came along and he took my wife, he took my girlfriend, he took my job. I hate this guy. He's interfering in all areas of his life. You see how upset, how he was injured. See, this is a four-column inventory. I just want you to understand that for the record here. (laughs) Well, we'll get to that. Where there is a fourth (laughs) column. These first three columns are the problem, not the solution. Right. Okay? I'm resentful at Mrs. Jones. She's a nut. She snubbed me. She committed her husband for drinking. 
He's my friend. She's a gossip. How would that affect him? My personal relationship. With his friend if she commits him? My self-esteem. He looks, if she's gossiping about him, it's threatening, it's damaging. If you've ever been around somebody who's gossiped, you know what I'm talking about. We're in a club, but get plenty of that around here. If you're anything like the rest of the clubs, and don't I'm, do it. Stop doing that. It's terrible. And I'm fearful. No. It's very threatening. It is. It's so damaging, whether it's real or not. It's just damaging. It, it really destroys the, the unity of the place. I'm resentful at my employer. Unreasonable, unjust, and overbearing, he threatens to fire me for drinking and padding my expense account. The gall. What, what a jerk. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> Affects my self-esteem, my security, and I'm afraid. Afraid of losing this job. See? So, I mean, even in looking at that, it looks a little absurd, doesn't it? But you want to get right the fourth column, even if you start to see what a foolish thing this anger is. You want to get to the exact nature of your mistakes, and we'll get to that. In a bit. Well, and there's a, there's a point here, too, that when I read this about somebody else, it looks absurd. Of course you're going to get fired if you're drinking and padding your expense account. But if it's me, if I'm in the middle of it, it doesn't look as foolish. It oh, looks yeah. like this, this employer is unjust and overbearing. That's what it looks like. We laugh at this stuff, but I'll tell you, if this was your crap and it was Mr. Brown doing this to you, you believe me, it would be a different story. Yeah, you got a question? I'm just wondering, does that first column use the word resentful or, or much other Or am I angry? Whatever you're angry at. Anger. Anger or resentment. Resentment, by the way, I'll read you a definition I took out of a dictionary. I, I don't know that it's the best, but it's one that I got. I took it on the run somewhere. It says, resent again. It means again, over and over and over. Again, center, to feel. To feel or show displeasure and hurt or indignation at some act or remark or toward a person from a sense of being injured or offended. So it means to re-feel the situation, you rehearse it over. This is why it's so damaging to the body and to the mind. It's so destructive. Because you re-feel it. You actually feel the thing over and over and over. It's very destructive. I'm resentful at my wife. She misunderstands and nags. She likes Brown. Oh, here comes Brown again. Wants house put in her name. So she can run away with Mr. Brown, I'm sure. <laughs> that affects my pride. My personal and sex relations, my security. This guy's scaring the hell out of me. He's afraid. He's afraid of losing his security, his money, his house, pride. I feel like a child. She won't let me have the house in my... I mean, it's just... Wow. It's devastating. These things are devastating when it's going on in your life. Say that we were usually as definite as this example, and just take a look at these examples. Don't write a 15-page essay about each one of these things. It doesn't say we were usually more definite than this example. It says we were usually as definite, maybe sometimes not. I confess I've written a little more than two or three sentences. But a few sentences. Who I'm angry at, what it's about. Get it down on paper. Basic and, and idea. Basic idea so we can move on because it, it is our story. The problem with spending too much time on this is literally if you're in the first three columns, you will see this through the fourth column, that you're in self-deception. That's what it is, okay? But you don't know that yet when you're writing this. You just have to get it down. You know, you probably, I think a lot of people uh, have some sense of this before they do it, and that's why they don't do it, because they have, they suspect that they're probably going to be wrong. <laughs> See, you know, I just won't look then. Well, that's how it's going to stay, by not looking. I'd be, I'd be more afraid not to do this than to do it. Because to not do it is going to keep the anger going, and it's going to keep hurting you. And why would you want to hurt yourself? So let's get out of it. Let's take a look. But, you know, the alcoholic mind, I, I see this in myself, and I'm sure you guys can see it in yourself. I would rather be bad than wrong. Don't tell me I'm wrong about anything. Darn it, I'm not wrong. But do you want to be happy, or do you want to be right? Yeah. Would be a better way to yeah. think of it. We went back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. 
When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. Yeah, to write this out in three columns, the world and its people are often quite wrong. No question about it. To conclude that others were wrong was as far as most of us ever got. That's as far as I ever got. You're wrong, I'm right, you did this thing to me, my life's a mess, it's because of you, I'm a failure because of you. It's just awful. I'm a victim. I'm victimized. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves, but the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. Yeah, the selfishness is right there again. See? As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Yeah, even if you win the useless argument, you're still negative. You still feel like crap after it, you know? It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. They're trying to show us that that's what's going on. My life is futile and I'm going to be unhappy if I hang on to this stuff. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Now there's another one of those sentences. What do they mean? Well, to the precise extent that I think about resentment, Anger, resentment is about something that's already gone, isn't it? It's already over. The event's over. Okay? I'm not hurt by the event anymore. I'm hurt by how I think about the event. You understand that? Who's hurting me now? I'm doing it to myself now. And I'm saying, well, I can't control myself and it's your fault that I can't. But I'm literally hurting myself because the event is gone. The past is over. Okay? If you're in the past, you will squander the hours that might have been worthwhile because you're in a gone place and you can only be alive right here and now. If you're in the future, anticipating the future, you're, the future's not here and now. How much time do I spend in gone places? Well, you will squander the hours, no question about it. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience... That's what AA is, the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience... This business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. They mean dead, dead. They're not talking figuratively here. They watched people die in the early fellowship because they would not look at this stuff. They'd come up against the fourth step, and probably the same thing that's going on today, they wouldn't go any further, see? And literally, they would drink again over this stuff, and these guys were in a condition of physical withdrawal from alcohol. Alcohol withdrawal itself can kill you. The reason that is is because the convulsions associated damage the brain to the point where it shuts down other body functions, see? And you literally die from the withdrawal itself. And that's the condition they were in. So when they're speaking about this, they're not speaking figuratively. They mean literally that this is what they saw. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the Spirit. I shut myself off from God's love or God. The insanity of alcohol returns and we drink again. And with us to drink is to die. That's why consequences won't keep you sober. You see that? Thinking about how bad it is isn't going to keep you sober. Plus, it's a pretty negative sobriety if that's the best you got. How about resolving your conflicts and you just start feeling better? Start healing your relationships. You heal the separation. See, the ins when you got anger going on, you shut yourself off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of booze comes back. I want to drink. Hey, you'll notice if you're, if you're not an alcoholic, say you're an al -Anon, I'll tell you, just look at your compulsions, whatever your compulsions are, whether they be for food, for sex, for money, for whatever, shopping, whatever it is that gets you out of your thinking, you'll do it. Your mind will go to that, see? Consequences won't keep you sober or keep you away from that stuff. All the compulsions come alive when you start building a case. It, it ha it's as true for me today as it was 20 years ago. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long you've been sober. It's irrelevant. Consequences are fear of something. It's just all negative energy and fear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. will not keep you sober. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. 
Yeah, and you hear people say, taking, uh, holding resentment is like taking poison, hoping the other guy dies. It's not hurting him. It's hurting me. This is the height of insanity. Height, height of insanity. Sorry about that. Height? Height of insanity. And, you know, if, if I could say that I'm really angry at you and my anger is going to hurt you, he could almost make a case for it. It's killing me, but it's, at least it's hurting him a little bit. But it isn't. He and our group who uh, was angry at his dad for like 10 years, 15 years. And he finally decided that he was going to do something about it. He was going to go talk to his dad. He sat down with his dad. You know, his dad said, I had no idea you felt that way. If I'd known you were that mad at me, we could have done something years ago. I had no idea. This guy was killing himself for years. Isn't that sad? Yes, this is what goes on. It's devastating. It's absolutely devastating for the guy holding it. We turn back to the list for it held the key to the future. We turn back to the story for it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. What's the angle we've been looking at it from? What they did to us, right? Now we're prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. You bet. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had power to actually kill. Why? We drink over it. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. It's, it's like in the, in the Wizard of Oz, there's a scene, and I think about this whenever I read this. There's the cowardly lion is standing there, and he's scared to death. And he's got his eyes, this image is just in my head. He's got his eyes closed, fists clenched, and he's going, I do believe, I do believe, I do. Well, he didn't believe, see? He's trying to force himself to believe something he don't believe in. It's the same with... We, now I know resentment's killing me, but I can't wish it away any more than alcohol. I couldn't get rid of the booze either. Wow, we've got to do something with this stuff. This was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Ooh, that sounds crazy. That, you know, the first time I read this, I thought, this is awful. Now we're going to justify crappy behavior from somebody, Right. Now I'm going to sit there and try and tell myself some stupid story and try, try to feel better or something and give some jerk a break. That's what I thought. And if you've been molested and you've been raped and you've been beaten and whatever happens to us, it happens all those things. I read that I thought, that is just ridiculous. But listen to what he says. This is really important. Perhaps they're spiritually sick. Okay. Though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. Okay, I don't like the symptoms of their spiritual sickness. You know, the way they acted and what they did to me? And the way these disturbed us. They, like ourselves, were sick too. Well, why do you say that, huh? They, like ourselves. Now, here's the thing I realized out of this. Do I want compassion and understanding for my stupidities? Now, I've made a lot of mistakes. If you got in this room, you've obviously made some mistakes, or you wouldn't be sitting here, okay? Now, you've probably done things like cheated on women or men. You may have been married or not. Maybe you ruined important relationships and you lost your family because you were so weak you couldn't control yourself around sex. Many of us have done this kind of thing. Maybe you stole money from your mother or your dad or somebody who was dying or you stole their drugs because you wanted their drugs when they were on pain meds or whatever it is, all kinds of things. Do I want compassion and understanding for my stupidities? You bet I do. Well, guess what? You're going to have to give that to others. You know why? Because you will judge yourself as harshly as you judge others. Do you see this? If they are guilty and need to be punished for their mistakes, then so am I. And if I can get a better picture of other people and start to give others a break, I will start to give myself a break. You're going to be as harsh with yourself as you are with others. That's just the way it is. You'll judge yourself accordingly. They're talking about self-forgiveness here. This isn't about forgiving somebody else. I'm hating others for my mistakes. Oh, I know that's, we'll get into that. That's a little, 
uh, beyond mean, where we are right now. Of but. all the uh, little cliches mm -hmm. that are around our uh, fellowship, one of them that actually has some substance is exactly what he just said. If you spot it, you got it. When I'm angry at somebody for some kind of behavior, it's because I got the same thing. Now, it might not be that I act the same way, but I'll tell you, it's a grievance. We ask God to help us same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. That's the beginning of how to get out of this judgment and this hate. I'm going to ask God to help me see it differently. I keep justifying my grievances. You understand that? The story, I keep rehearsing it and I keep justifying my position. I need help to see this differently. This is a key idea. I didn't believe in God. I went into this fourth column with the attitude of, I need to see this differently. But anyway, that's how we're going to look at people as sick people. We're going to try and get a better perception of this. We're going to try and... Now, it might be still a judgment to say somebody's sick, but it's a better judgment than he's a jerk or he... You know what I mean? So it's a pointer away from the problem instead of deeper into it. It's a beginning step. God, help me see this differently. And what they're saying is they, like ourselves, were sick too. I'm an alcoholic. I have behaved in ridiculous ways toward other people. When other people are behaving in ridiculous ways toward me, are they just doing the same stuff I was doing? Do I want to break? That, that's what we're looking at here. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? Hey, being helpful might be just quit hurting him. Quit trying to set him back, okay? <laughs> Give him a break. Just stop aggressively trying to put him in his place, you know? That'd be helpful in itself. God, save me from being angry. Thy will be done. These are prayers. These are prayers that you walk into this fourth column with. This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God, save me from being angry. God, help me to see this differently. That's really all this paragraph is saying. And if you can just go into it, if you don't believe in God, say to yourself, help me see this differently. We avoid people that way. Why not? If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. There's that third step decision again coming up. The idea of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. Each and every one where? On our list, right? I've got a name. Let's take a name of somebody that I've got a resentment for. Write it across the columns. Okay, we put some sheets out. I don't know if you guys got these or not. They're on the back table back there. You can grab it after. Uh, Maybe we can get through this, and we'll show you this fourth column, and then we can we can close this up tonight. It'll go pretty quick now. So you got the story on the front of the sheet. We put on the sheet, put one name for each, or one resentment for each sheet. One name. Don't try and list four things like they show you in the book. Just to, It'll get too confusing on the back. You'd have to use a different sheet or whatever. We've made a template, basically, so you could at least get an experience of it with one. All right? So you put, now here, we're going to go into the fourth column now. we got the story on the front, right? In three columns, it looks just like it does in the book. Just write it out. Okay, here comes the fourth column. And, and let me just do this real quick. There are lots of arguments and justifications for writing a whole great big long list. Some people will say you got to do the whole first column, write out the entire first column before you move on. I don't know honestly where that came from. It's not in the in the book. It, it, there is a list, and the list has four things. Uh, I think what he was doing was giving us examples of four different kinds of situations. I right. think that's really what the list was for. If you insist on making a list, then please make four. Don't make any more than four. I, I've never seen in the book where it says you have to make a whole... I'll tell you what happens when you do that. I sponsored a guy some years ago. I would ask him periodically, how are you coming with this? Are you going across the columns? And he'd, no, no, I'm making my first column. Well, I, I wish you'd go, no, no, I'm doing my first column. Get 168 names. He was so angry, he got drunk. He got overwhelmed. See, so you start looking at your hate and it gets to be too much. Go across the columns. It doesn't matter. Take one name and go across. I, I'm telling you, I've seen this time and time again where people stop doing it because they get too overwhelmed with it. 
just take a name and get some resolution. The other thing is, is that there isn't as much inside of you as you think. I'm telling you, what I saw when I took inventory is when I released one with my dad, there were about 20 people that I was angry at that were different forms of the same judgment. And when I healed it with my dad, all 20 of them dropped off. And the relief was like, my God, it was amazing. And we'll tell you stories of this as the weekend, as the tomorrow goes on with this, of, of experiences that we've had. Yeah, we okay. give ourselves too much credit. You know, there's 10 or 15 things that we're mad about. That's yeah, about it. Might only be a couple yeah. when you get right down to and it. And once I did this, I, did, I had some stuff between uh, my older and my younger son. And uh, once I got relief from that, it, then it becomes a pleasure to do it. Now, it's not a burden to do this anymore. Now, it's a pleasure to do this inventory because whenever I do this, I'm going to feel better. I'm going to have an awareness. I'm going to feel better whenever I do this. So, referring, here's the fourth column, referring to our list again. The story. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely look for our own mistake. Now, we're going to put out of our mind the wrongs they did. Now, the wrongs that that person did is on the first side of the sheet, right? The beginning of it. Turn it over. Put out of your mind the wrong. Now you got the fourth column listed on the sheet. Okay? Now it's not staring you in the face, the wrongs that they did. But you still got their name in your mind. Okay? Now, where had we resolutely looked for our own mistakes? Now the questions are where the mistakes are. And if you'll just ask these questions honestly of yourself, you'll start to have your own experience. Okay? So here's the question. Now, we're looking for our mistakes, not our part. Oh, very important. You very hear people important. all over the fellowship say, well, I'm looking for my part. No, we're not. We're putting out of our mind the wrongs others had done. If we're looking for our part, we're assuming somebody else had a part, and I'm not putting out of my mind the wrongs others had done. They're going to say it twice in this paragraph, okay, in a different way. We'll read it. We'll show you. It says, it'll say it. So the point is, I put out of my mind the wrongs others had done, and I start to look for where I made mistakes in this relationship in its entirety. The whole relationship. Not the thing I'm angry at, but what was my whole relationship with this person like? And where did I make mistakes? You've already taken their inventory on the other side, so you got it written down. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we'll give you that much. We tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. See it? Said it again. Put out of your mind the wrongs others had done and disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. So there's part of your eight-step list of the people you've hurt. Okay? And this will be the exact nature of your mistakes or your wrongs, whichever way you want to call it. You see that? Okay? So what are we doing now? Okay? I, I put out of my mind the wrongs others had done, turn the sheet over, and I look for where did I make mistakes in this relationship? And the question, where had I been selfish? Now, we put on the sheet, acting without concern for others. Selfish. Write down all the things that you did that you can think of. This isn't to make you guilty. It's to get some perspective on this. Okay? Write down selfish. Then write down, where had I been dishonest? Now, we put on here dishonest to get what I want. Dishonesty can take many forms. It might be lying. It might be stealing. It might be cheating. It might be... Like with my dad, I used to go and tell my dad sad stories of how bad my life was, hoping he would offer me money. You see, I didn't want to borrow money because I had to pay that back. But if I could manipulate him into giving me the money, and he would often do that, see. Well, I remember one time I went and I was telling him this story, and he missed his cues. He didn't pick up that he was supposed to give me the money, see. And, and then I left angry, that son of a gun. I walked away ranting and raving to myself about what a jerk he was. Well, I never even asked him for the money. But he missed his cues. See, he didn't quite do it the way I expected him to. So that's dishonest, manipulating, controlling to get what I want. Okay? This one's a little different. 
where had we been self-seeking and frightened? Now, generally, we think of frightened as, they scared me. He's a bully. I'm afraid of him. Now you've got your fear outside of yourself. What we're looking for is this. If I'm seeking for myself, I'll be afraid of losing what I got. If I'm seeking for myself, I'll be afraid of not getting what I want. That's taking responsibility for the fear. You see this? That's bringing the fear back here because the fear is in me. Even if the guy out there is a bully, I'm still afraid of what? Losing my health, being beaten up. The fear is still in me. Okay? So where was I self-seeking? Seeking for myself and afraid I'd lose what I got or not get what I want. Write down what, what you're afraid of. Losing. You know, this sort of thing. Okay? Self-seeking and frightened. What I saw when I did this, I started to see, not that I was bad, I saw that my stories weren't accurate. If your stories aren't accurate, your anger is not justified. And if your anger is not justified, you'll start to feel better because you don't have the resentment anymore. And literally, this is what happened when I started to write this. Now, I didn't believe in God, but I started to get thoughts that changed how I viewed things, and they were not thoughts from my mind. I was getting help. Why? Because I asked God to help me see this differently. And then I opened my mind in this way by asking these questions. Now, you'd think this is going to make you guilty. It doesn't. What happens is, yes, you have to take responsibility for what happened, okay? But what literally <laughs> happened to me was I was accusing and blaming others of my mistakes. Then I was pouring energy into hating them for the very things I did to myself. Who do you think you're hating when you're pouring energy into hating somebody for ruining your life? Yourself. Who are you going to forgive when you stop resenting and hating somebody for ruining your life? I'll give you examples of this from my own life tomorrow. We'll talk about this. Write something and see what happens. Just take a name. You don't have to. And if you get stonewalled, go to the next one. Take another name and try that one. See if you can get some perspective and see what happens. Okay? Yeah. I would recommend that, yeah. And then turn the page over, put out of your mind the wrongs they did. You can look at the text. We put the text on top of the thing. There's a prayer, you know, God help me see this differently. And then go into the fourth column, asking the right question, see what happens. You know what the worst that can happen is? You'd be the same. And I'll bet you're not the same after you leave here tonight. Just reading this, you, you change. Seriously, the worst thing that can happen is nothing. <laughs> the worst thing that can happen is nothing. So, if, anybody got any questions about It's pretty simple, isn't it? You just write your story down. It's, this is so simple, it's almost hard to miss. Yet we miss it. We think it's got to be more complicated than this. No, it doesn't. This is transformative. Well, the word moral causes people to think that this is some kind of a moral judgment. This is some kind of being bad. And it isn't being bad. It's looking for my mistakes. Getting honest. Okay? Does it make sense? Now the question is, will you do it? But I'm telling you, one experience of this, and you'll never be not motivated again. That's exactly what happened to me. Once you have an one experience, shot. the relief for you is tremendous. Just like the problem is tremendous, the resentment is tremendously bad, the solution is tremendously good. You can't miss because you're asking God to help you. Sound reasonable? Look at that. We're right on time. It's 930. Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.